thing. Amen? So they have to keep quiet. All right. Well, uh, I, I, I try really hard to uh, be able to preach uh, the original notes that I had uh, prepared probably here 40 years ago now for this message. And uh, I didn't succeed in being able to do that one meet one, uh, what I want to say, uh, service, yeah. one service. So uh, I had another message for tonight, but <clears throat> what we're going to do is what Brother Russell said, we'll just continue with uh, <clears throat> what was originally entitled the seven birthmarks of a true believer. Amen. To turn back to Philippians 3, 17 through 21, uh, that's one of the places I uh, gleaned the title from. Of course, the other one is being born again. So if you're born again, you have birthmarks. Not of corrupt seed, but of incorrupt seed by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. But Philippians 3.17 is where we began. And so we'll look back again there, where the Apostle Paul says, and I'll read down through 17 through 21, and then uh, we'll have a word of prayer and begin. Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so do you us for an example. For many walk, whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. And again, Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity to meet in your house. We're thankful for this church uh, that you raised up here in this area. Pray that we would remain faithful to you, that you would direct us in all things, that we'd be sensitive to your spirit in <clears throat> all that we do. We pray for the upcoming presentations, for the missile prepares, and folks prepare, Lord, and practice. We pray that you would bring those who to this room where you'd have to be here and that your will would be done. We ask that your spirit would speak mightily to the hearts of those who come concerning their need <coughs> and their walk with you. And uh, may folks be exhorted to live for Christ. As we realize, Lord, that, that we need to work for the night comes when no man can, can work. And uh, Lord, as we see this world uh, heading headlong to uh, wickedness and evil, we, we believe that you're going to come soon. So we pray that we would uh, be prepared for that day when we would either stand before you in death or that you would come and uh, take us home. We uh, pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts tonight. I pray that you direct me to uh, speak in the power of your spirit to the needs represented here. That's only you know. And uh, may we know that we've met with the true and living God here tonight in this place. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And again, uh, Paul says, Mark them who walks with him, us as, as an example, but uh, Paul also, as I said so many times this morning, is not looking down his nose at anybody, for when he talks about those who don't have the marks, in verse 18, he says, many walk of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even what? Weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, <coughs> uh, and whose, God, whose end is destruction. And so Paul is weeping sincerely and genuinely for those who don't have the marks of a true believer, and that's certainly our attitude here tonight. Uh, my heart is burdened for those who are not saved. I don't have any kind of condescending attitude in presenting this message. I'm trying to communicate that, though I have been accused of that. Uh, that's not my heart at all. If you don't have the marks, I'm not, I'm, I'm not mad at you. I, I love you, and those who are saved here tonight love you, and we, that we would wish that uh, you would come to the end of uh, yourself, the end of sin, the end of serving Satan, and trust in Christ and uh, yield your life to him, and he will indeed implant into your life these marks that we've been looking at. This morning we looked at three marks of the seven that I had on the page before me, and I'll just quickly review that. Uh, the first, well, you tell me, the first birth mark we found in Luke 13, 3, and Jesus Christ said, I tell you nay, but except you what? <laughs> Repent, you shall all likewise perish. And again, I share with you, many uh, today are contending whether that ought to be preached on or not, but there, there are so many passages. I don't have time to take you through all of the passages. I think I took you through enough this morning that talk about 
the message of repentance. And uh, they get uh, confused and tangled up and think it's a work that we're telling people that they have to accomplish. It's not a work at all. Uh, but uh, we need to realize that we, have, we when we when, when you come to repentance, when God brings you to repentance, you wave the white flag. <laughs> you don't you you you, uh, you trust Him, you believe in Him, you yield to Him, you acquiesce to God and His will. And so we gave you a definition of repentance, and we gave you many verses uh, on that uh, that doctrine in the Bible. And so biblical repentance, it is a biblical mark, it is a biblical. Doctrine, it is something that needs to be preached. As uh, There's many, many passages. If you just did a little study on the word repentance, you'll find many, many passages where that's spoken of. That brought us to the second word, Mark, which is a new heart. We get a new heart. We need a new heart because the heart is the seat of all things and desperately wicked. And again, God gives us that new heart. We looked at Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, telling us that the heart's wicked and that the Lord searches the heart. We also talked about Ezekiel 18, 31. Uh, where he talks about a new heart, and in Ezekiel 36, 26, the Lord says, Also a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Amen, amen, amen. That's uh, what happens when you get born again. You get a new heart from God. He puts a new spirit within you. He takes away the stony heart out of your flesh and gives you a, a new heart of flesh. <clears throat> you become a new creature in Christ by the grace of God if you've come to that place in your life. And if you have not, you need to cast yourself on the mercy of God. And trust in Him and, and believe Him. This new heart, I have a whole message on that subject of the new heart. That message is called the most wicked place in town. The most wicked place in town is not, uh, what's that place down there going to 81 there, the old booze joint down there? Lift in. Lift in? That ain't, that ain't the most wicked place in town. Uh, Chats ain't the most wicked place in town. No, no, the most wicked place in town is not uh, the uh, pornography shops, or the uh, uh, the bar rooms or the nightclubs or places that we think are wicked. The most wicked place in this town is right here. It's the heart of man. And so that's, we talk about the heart in that message. But that's the second birthmark of a new believer. You get a new heart. Jesus Christ said out of the, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, seditions, on and on and on and on. And he exposes the heart in the book of Mark. I, I, I know that. And uh, we're not preaching that message, so I best to go on. But uh, you get a new heart. Now, a new heart in that message, uh, I spent a whole message on the new heart. You get new motives. You're motivated a new way. You were once motivated towards self, towards sin, towards serving the devil. But that new heart is motivated to glorify God. And you get new tastes. As newborn babes desire to milk, sincere milk of the word, you might grow thereby. You hunger for God's truth and his word rather than the things that you once tasted for and hungered for. And you get new principles, ideals, standards. I talked about Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's one of the longest psalms. I think it probably is the longest psalm that's in the book of Psalms. 176 verses. And almost every verse, if you study that, and I encourage you to read that, it's a precious, precious psalm. But uh, every one of those verses, he's talking about his law, his testimonies, his precepts, his statutes. His commandments, His judgment, His words. God gives us new. He gives us new principles to live by. Uh, some of them we may have accidentally lived by, but we didn't attribute them to God and the grace of God. <clears throat> Sometimes we learn proper etiquette and things like that. Sometimes those things are biblical, but we ought to start with the Bible. We should do things because the Bible tells us they're right, and uh, we do learn some of those things along the course of our life and growing up in this country because uh, so many of our founding fathers were believers and they used to, uh, uh, to tre treasure the Ten Commandments and, and not be ashamed to hang them up and do uh, things that this uh, society wants to change and tear down, amen? So uh, you get new standards, you get new standards, and I could spend a lot of time talking about that. And then you get a love for the brethren, a, a common bond, a family bond with the people of God that you never had before you got saved, you never had any affinity towards God's people. And that common bond is in Christ Jesus. It's not, you know, we have, some of us here, we have uh, <clears throat> common things that we enjoy. Some of us are hunters, and we talk about hunting. And, and, but that's not really what our fellowship is based around. We, we, like, we like hunting. And, so, and you know, some of us like, some of you like sports, and you, you have fellowship around sports and, to some degree. But our fellowship is not based on those things. Our fellowship is in Christ. Amen? Amen. 
and, and it doesn't matter what personality you have, it doesn't matter what background you came out of, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, it doesn't matter any of those things. When you get saved, all those things go away. And uh, you love the brethren. The Bible says that we are to, uh, uh, it, it says uh, we're to love one another. And marvel not, my brother, the world hates you, but we know we pass from death unto life. We know that. We know that because, why? Remember? We love the brethren. 1 John 3, 14. That's how we know that. So that's a birthmark of a true believer. Uh, you, you have affinity towards the people of God, people that love God. You like those people. You, you have a draw to those people. And you love them in the Lord because uh, the same thing has happened to you has happened to them. And you're part of the family of God. So then... Uh, we looked at uh, 1 John 3, uh, I think it was about 10, uh, yeah, 10 through 19, and we did that quickly towards the end, <clears throat> then looked at 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, which uh, talked about laying aside all malice, the word malice is kakia, doesn't even sound good, that means spite, it means evil intention to injure, injure or malign others. And so we're to lay aside all of that. And, that. and that's what we do. God works a work in our hearts that enables us to do that. We, we get sensitized toward the Spirit of God when we get saved. Uh, though at one time we may have been we had spiteful and we had evil intention. We'd, uh, we'd, uh, you know, we'd injure somebody that injured us and so on and so forth. And, and uh, that's probably still in some of us. But it's not, not the Christian attitude, the Christian spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us of these things and enables us to do what's not natural, what is supernatural. It says, so wherefore laying aside all malice, <clears throat> that is spite, evil intention, injury, injury, so forth, um, and to uh, and all guile, the word is dolas, and hypocrisies, both of those words contain the idea of being deceptive, phony, fallacious, uh, dissimulating. In other words, you smile at somebody while you stab them in the back. And uh, that ought not to be so in the church, uh, but sometimes it does exist. And I think some of those who maintain that spirit are probably lacking the birthmarks, never have gotten saved. And people join clubs. We talked about clubhouses and here in the summertime at the tent meeting, and uh, that happens. And so I hope that's not the case with you. I hope you've been born again, and you're here tonight because of the work that God's Spirit did in your heart, and uh, that you're drawn here to... To, because of your love for the brethren, love for God's word, we're going to get to that, and the fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. So we looked at that <coughs> text in 1 Peter 2, 1, 1 through 3, and it talks about all envies, that also has to do with ill will, uh, defamation, seek injury, it's got to do with uh, negativity and jealousy or pride, and it involves all of those things. Now, those, these words in the Greek are very, very full of meaning. And, of course, they are in English that we study them. But, uh, and, and all evil speaking, that is, uh, cattle, cattleia, defamation and backbiting. And so I talked to you about my experience when I was a young boy having professed salvation but not having any affinity toward the people of God. I didn't, I didn't like them. I thought they were kind of goofy, especially my Sunday school teacher, who I love dearly today. He's still alive. <clears throat> just contacted uh, us just a little bit ago. And uh, he's down in Delaware. He's, uh, he, I guess he's going in and out with his getting kind of dementia light and so forth, his son told us. But uh, he, he was watching some of the, uh, listening to some of the messages on the website here at the church. And so they contacted us. I don't know if I told you that, if you knew that, but that's a blessing. Mr. Shannon, who we talk about quite often, and uh, God, God raised him up as a great blessing to my family. <coughs> so uh, the Bible says, uh, Marvel not. My brethren, if the world hates you, uh, they hated Jesus first. That brings us to the next birthmark that we're going to go on with tonight, and that's found in 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23. We quoted this verse many times, being what? Born again. Born again, not a corruptible seed. See, this is a second verse. This is not, this is not because corruptible seed is... Uh, a man gets together with a woman, a sinner, and a sinner get together, and they have a, 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 another sinner. That's, that's the birth from corruptible seed. But this birth is not of corruptible seed. This is it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. By incorruptible seed, by the what? Word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then you slip down to First uh, Peter 2, 2 and 3. Or is it my right place, First Peter? 
Yeah, First Peter 2, 2 and 3, as what? Newborn, Newborn babes do what? Desire. Desire. The sincere milk of the word you might grow thereby. Uh, we learned something about babies years ago when our first child was born. When, when a baby's born, they can't live without the, the, their food, amen? Oh, yeah. And they'll go, wah, 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 they'll make a lot of noise in the middle of the night and weep and cry and they desire their food. So when you get saved, you have a, a, an insatiable desire for the Word of God. Not only do you have an insatiable desire for it, but it makes sense to you. Yeah. This book can be read like an English book, like a history book. Right. But uh, I never cease to be amazed what people do with it when, when they read it. I remember before I was saved, I always said I was saved and I believe in God and I believe in all these things and blah, 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 blah. I'd be in a hotel room somewhere and nobody around, nobody looking, I'd lock the door, you know, and I'd go in that little drawer by the bed, those Gideons always stuck one in there, you know, and I'd say, well, you know, I, you know, I remember when I was a kid going to Sunday school and all that. I said, well, let me, let me try to read that Bible. Yeah. I'd take that thing and I'd, I'd turn somewhere. I'd go, thief, thou, luff, loath, loof, thou, ah, who can understand that? I believe in you, God. I believe in you, but I, that book, I can't get that book. No, no, no. When you get saved, you get a hunger for the Word of God, and you get a supernatural understanding of the Word of God. Look at 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. We, we know this passage, but let's look at it quickly. It's good to look at it once in a while. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Actually, let's go, up, let's go up to verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Now, the word save there is, again, an archaic word. It means accept. Accept. The, the, so, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? In other words, we relate to each other as people because you have a spirit of a human being and I have a spirit of a human being. Yeah. It says, uh, for um, even so, the things of God knoweth who? No, no man, but the spirit. spirit of God. Okay, so you have to have the spirit of God to understand the word of God. This book is supernatural. And the more you share it with people who you know, the more you're going to see that. I, 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 I said this before, bro. I never get so blessed as when I take this book and I'm sharing, I mean, plain, simple truths in the Scripture, and, and I'm witnessing somebody, and, and they discombobulated, they twist it all up, they, they fight against it. And I, I don't mean I'm blessed that they're, they're lost, but when I see that happening, I'm, I'm overwhelmed again that something supernatural happened to this old boy a few years ago, amen? God opened our eyes to this Word. And if your eyes have been opened to this truth and you understand it and it blesses your heart, it makes sense to you, <coughs> you have a birthmark of a true believer. Yeah. If you desire to study it and know it and grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the birthmark. It says, verse 12, now we, Paul's talking to Christians, we Christians have received not the spirit of the world, we had that, see, we already had it, but we have the spirit, we received the spirit which is of who? God, God that we might want know the things that are freely given to us of God. Amen, 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 amen. And uh, true Christians, those who have the mark, they know these things. And it says, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But, say, but <clears throat> the natural man, man before he's born again, in his natural state, sinful state, before we were saved, it's just like when I was in that motel room, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for there are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, and that word know is, is an, a Greek word, gnosko, it means understand them experientially. He can't take a hold of them. And here's why. Because they are spiritually discerned. You, you can only discern this book by the Spirit of God. And if you do, you, you need... You, you, I mean, if you just meditate on that one point, that ought to rejoice your soul if you have a hunger for this book, because that's supernatural. Human beings do not, and, and just go out and witness. You'll see, they'll repel this thing. They'll turn it off. It'll, it'll turn them away. They'll, they'll listen to any kind of religious garbage you, you want to come up with. But you take this book and, and take it out and open it up and try to share it. And uh, you'll get all kinds of uh, uh, problems with people, uh, especially if you open the Bible. It says, he that is spiritual judge all things, and he himself is judge of no man, and so on and so forth. So, the, the next verse, Mark, is understanding and having an insatiable desire for the Word of God. <clears throat> Something we didn't have 
previous to our salvation. I quoted Psalm 119, 162 this morning, where David says, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil, great treasure. And uh, I love the word of God since I got saved. I, I didn't read much of anything before I got saved, but when I got saved, I tell the story often, I got a hunger for the word of God and a desire to read, and I thank God for that. And I, I, I never have stopped reading since that day. Now, I guess, how many years ago was that? 1973. So pretty many years ago, <laughs> many, many years ago. And that brings me to the next birthmark that you'll find in Luke 18 and verse 1. Turn there. Luke 18, 1. These are all in the Bible. This is not something I made up. It says you'll have these marks, and this, uh, I said this sermon is saturated with Scripture. It's what God says in His Word. It's not something we made up here at Oakdale Baptist. <coughs> it's His Word. Luke 18, 1. And you'll read in Luke 18, 1, the words of Jesus Christ. And he spake a parable unto them, that's Jesus spake a parable unto them, that men ought always to what? Pray. And not to what? Pray. And the next birthmark of a true believer? Pray. Prayer. You're 100% absolutely, positively wrong. Everybody prays. Everybody prays. I used to pray before I was saved. When do people pray, folks? You know about that kind of man, don't you? And you want to see trouble? That's walking trouble. That's I pulled his strategy out. This one. That's, that's walking trouble right there. You know? I pulled the wrong one. In. That was trouble too, but this was worse than trouble. But I got another one of him. You know what I'm talking about. That's bad trouble. I mean, that was many, many that's over 40 years ago. I wasn't hanging around with Sunday school kids. And I, I, I tell I give an illustration, long illustration, and in the series of messages that I give on this subject, tell what kind of trouble I used to get in. And one night uh, where there was a, well, I probably got enough telling you. But, I mean, I, it was, you, you hang around them places out there where they're having so much fun tonight. They're gonna have fun over the Christmas holidays and the gin mills and the joints and the bars and all that. I mean, I don't, say, I don't know how many barroom brawls and shootouts and knife fights and people getting stabbed. And, I mean, that's a lot of fun, man. I, I was in a whole lot of that having fun back there those years ago. Well, I didn't hang around those places too much. I was usually performing, but once in a while we, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, went to these. I remember one night, uh, my, one of my saxophone players and I were driving down Route One, and uh, I got to go quick. And uh, we noticed on a marquee, on a sign out in front of a club on Route One between Philadelphia and Trenton, New Jersey, that a certain band was performing there that we knew. And so uh, it was almost uh, two o'clock. It's the end of the night for bar rooms. This was a bar room band. Who we knew, so uh, <clears throat> I said to my saxophone play, player, Joe Biancasino, who by the way, I just found out his son was just murdered down, I'm getting off the track. I just found him on the internet, his, his boy, who I never met, never even knew he had a boy, got murdered down in the south somewhere. He was gonna be a lawyer, or my wife can't, she's not here, but uh, some terrible thing happened to him. But Joe and I were in this car, and <clears throat> I said, hey Joe, so and so's playing in here tonight, let's, let's stop, we're gonna be done in the middle, stop singing. So we, we pulled in, and we went into this nightclub, and we didn't realize it, but the Breed Motorcycle Club was there in full force. They had the colors on, and uh, we got in there, and uh, my buddy was getting done his last set there, and uh, so uh, the bartender come around and did what they do in the bar rooms. Some of you know about it, about five minutes to two. Uh, see, the bar rooms like the bank at, at, uh, at two o'clock, you can't any longer purchase any more booze, uh, but you can purchase all that you want previous to 2 o'clock and sit there and drink it. They lock the door at 2 o'clock, and they let you out one by one with a key, like, like the bank would do if you were in the bank doing business. And uh, you're not supposed to know about the other place, so I'm using the bank because all you good people want to go to the bank, right? <laughs> and so we were in this place, and it was ten, five, ten minutes before two, and the bartender came around. I heard it clear as a bell, and he made this last call for alcohol. You know, they went to drink, go buy you drinks. Well, there was two guys I overheard at the bar who were having a bachelor party, or there was two guys that they were having a bachelor party, and there was two guys. I think the guy was to be married the next day, and one of his buddies were sitting there at the bar. And they were so drunk they didn't hear the last call. They didn't hear the guy come around. But the motorcycle gang—they never missed the last call. 
And, and they, they load up the bar with a round and drinks and took a horse. I mean, they were just full. It's them to stern. They just they were going to stay there until the sun came up, I'm sure. So this yeah, there was quite a few of them in there. I knew some of them. They followed my band, and that was a good thing, probably, because uh, at least I had a little bit of respect for some of them. I didn't hang around with them. I didn't ride with them, but uh, I knew them. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I was standing right there when, when uh, the guy that's going to get married the next day says, Bartender, Bartender, it was, it was now after 2 o'clock. And this guy, he's drunk as a skunk. He calls the bartender and he says, hey, Bartender, give me and my buddy a drink. And Bartender says, fellas, I'm sorry. So he can't serve you. You see, there could be a liquor control board agent in that bar. And if they serve after 2 o'clock, they can get shut down and get big trouble, big fine, so forth. So the, the bartender tried to explain that to this guy. We're going to get married. And he said, well, I want to get married tomorrow. And he starts a little bit of hassle, like, you know, because he's on the booze and stuff. And uh, it made a little bit of noise, and finally they shut up. I, I was standing right there, and I was renewing acquaintances with my buddy who came off the stage, and we're talking a little bit. And that guy, I, I just, I was tuned in to what was going on there. And, and uh, as time went on, <coughs> I kept watching these two dudes who were going to this bachelor party, and they kept looking down that bar at that motorcycle gang's drinks. And, and I kept thinking, I hope they're not going to do what I think they're going to do. I, I just hope that ain't going to happen. But sure enough, <coughs> the guy that was going to get married the next day slides down there and he grabs a couple drinks from the motorcycle gang's drinks and slides them up and said, here, have a drink on me. And I said, uh-oh. I'm all exaggerating a little bit. The biggest dude in that club was probably, he was six, six foot six and he was an inch tall. Great big broad shoulder dude. His nickname was Critter. I, I knew him. And I'd seen him before. He looked like Herman Munster. Remember that dude? I mean, he's a big dude. He's six foot six and an inch tall. Big broad shoulders. Got the green colors on his back. He comes up to that bar. He takes a bottle of beer off that bar. Breaks it on the side of the bar and drives it in the man's face who's to be married the next day. You seen Cowboys and Indians on TV? You seen Marvel and Rolls on television? That's a Sunday school picnic here in the middle of what I'm about to be in the middle of. All of a sudden, man, hell, hell breaks loose. I mean, chains are coming out. Knives are coming out. People are running and screaming. I, women are being picked up bodily and thrown across the room. People are everywhere. And I'm saying, oh, Lord, get me out of here. I run as fast as I can through that crowd. People are screaming and hollering. I know them guys carry guns. I mean, the real thing. Lead, bull, bullets, bang, 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 you know. And I said, I need to get out of here. I get out to the front vestibule of that bar room, and they got the door locked. Because it's after two o'clock. And I'm out there and I'm trying to get out. I picked up the, the remember that, what are they called? Bubblegum machine? Got that lead base? I smashed that door with that bubblegum machine, busted that door open, and, and <coughs> ran out into that parking lot. I went up to my buddy's car, and the car is locked. I went to the next car. He said, Who's was it? I don't know. Anybody. I just want to get out of here. I'm going to the next car. I'm, I'm, I'm going in the park. My, my buddy's car is locked, and I lost my buddy. I'm out there in the middle of that parking lot, and I'm about scared to death. And all of a sudden, <laughs> here's the guy about two cars away from me who had the bottle stuck in his face in another car. Comes out of the car with some automatic pistol in his hand. Some automatic pistol means when you put a bolt in the chamber, it's ready to shoot. Every time you pull the trigger, bullets come out. He cocked that gun, got blood running all down his face, and he's screaming, I'll, yeah, he's cussing, I can't say what you're saying. I'll kill every long hair, creep by the vine, that blackity black black motor's there. He's waving that gun around. I'm standing probably near that piano. Away from this dude, hair down to here, black leather jacket, what a motorcycle jacket. And my friends, I got cold sweats. I bowed my head and I was sweating. I, I could go right back here like yesterday. And I said, oh, please, Lord. Please, God, don't let them see me. I mean, don't, don't let them shoot me, Lord. I said, Lord, I, I'm a rock and roll star. I was telling God who I was. I, I really was. That's what I'm doing. I'm saying, I can't die out here in this dirty parking lot. Like, this, this ain't the way for me to die. Well, who in the world I think I was? God should have left me right there in that parking lot. I'm telling God, uh, this ain't where I deserve to die. Well, who do I think I was? Amen. I'm saying, please, Lord, don't let that, what a waste this is going to be. Oh, yeah. What, what a waste. The world would have really missed me. But that's how I felt. And I'm crying and begging God and pleading with God. And pretty soon, this guy's buddies come out. What are you doing, man? Get rid of that gun. Cops are going to be here. We got to get out of here. And they loaded up in the car. They can walk down and watch. Yeah, man, get him out of here. Amen. Pretty soon, I see my, my buddy Joe. He's running out of that nightclub. 
Here's what your friends will do for you in the world, by the way. <clears throat> I, I, his car was locked, so I'm way down the parking lot looking for some place to crawl under a car. And I see him come running toward his car, and he's getting in the car, got the keys. He's, we didn't have them open, how you open now with the buttons. He's going to get, get the thing and open it. And I, I start running, Joe, hey, Joe, Joe, wait for me. Joe jumped in the car. He had taken off and left me. He drove my leg halfway down the highway getting out of there. Amen? He just left me standing there. He didn't care about me. He said, I, I said, where, where were you? He said, I was inside there underneath the table. The table cloth pulled down. Nobody could see me. He got under a table with a table cloth pulled down. And uh, I said, man, I almost got shot in the park. I almost got killed, man. A guy with a bottle stuck in his face. He had a gun, blah, 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 blah. I said, man, whew, lucky, man. That was a good thing. Lucky thing. He said, well, we made it, amen. He said, he didn't say amen. He said, uh, well, what do you want to do now? I said, well, I said, there's a party. I said, what's going on? I said, I said, there's a party down here in Levittown, right around here. I know there's a party going on over here, blah, 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 blah. And, and we went on to the party and left God in the parking lot. Amen? And that's what we do in the world. That's how we pray in the world. This doesn't say pray. It said that men ought what? That men ought... That men ought... Next word. Always to pray. The mark of a true believer is Philippians. Excuse me, not Philippians. Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. You see, it's prayer and adherence to prayer. True Christians don't just pray when they're in trouble. Everybody prays like I prayed when I was in trouble. Amen. My brother Ray, he was in Vietnam. I bet you heard a lot of praying over there. Yeah. I bet you a lot of guys praying in Vietnam. I mean, we can't even imagine what brothers like him went through, and some of you others maybe too. Jack, were you in Vietnam? Yeah, Jack was in Vietnam. Uh, I have no pretty picture. I'm reading right now. Uh, brother Ray got me some books, and I had a bunch of books, and I didn't go to Vietnam. I used to. Uh, probably out of half the guilt, I used to play a lot of uh, benefits for guys that lost, that stepped on landmines, lost their arms and legs, and all kind of things like that. It was hard, man. It was hard. We used to play big concerts for those guys, but <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't go. I got deferred, and I didn't run away to Canada. But uh, I was glad at that time I didn't go. Amen. But anyway, uh, uh, they do a lot of praying over there, especially with what I'm reading goes on. I mean, anybody who's in any kind of war, you know that it's called foxhole Christianity. Amen. Guys pray when they get in trouble. But that's not the Christian way. When you get saved, it's men ought always to pray and not to faint. And not to faint. And not to faint. You pray without ceasing. I, I could be driving my car praying. In fact, sometimes I am. Somebody looking at me wondering who I'm talking to. Not anymore, they don't, because everybody talks. They get them just to record this thing now for fun. But everybody does that now. But back years ago, I didn't have that. I'd be praying, and people look at me like, what the world are you talking to? But uh, I get this common now. You've got everybody talking to something. But uh, Matthew 6, 5 through 7 says, and, and but thou, I'll turn there and look at this passage. Matthew 6, 5 through 7. But thou, when thou prayest, talking about his, to his disciples, <clears throat> and, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they might be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, now Jesus has given his, uh, his, his disciples instruction, enter into the closet, and when you have what? Shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not what? Vain. vain. The word vain means empty. It means empty means meaningless, empty. Vanity is emptiness. But when you pray, use not empty repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they should be heard for their much speaking. There's a religious uh, system to teach people to say the same prayers over and over and over again, just memorize prayers, just root catechism. That's not what Jesus said to do. When you pray, a true Christian with the true mark of a true believer <coughs> has God as their who? Pray to you or who? Your Father. And you talk to Him in all sincerity believing that he is and he is a reward of them that doesn't only seek him, that he's present in our midst as even as we be here tonight. He's here. We need to be aware of that. When we pray, we do not use vain or empty repetitions as the heathen do, but they think they should be heard for their much speaking. Now, by the way, 
God doesn't hear the prayers of unregenerate people who pray like I prayed in that part. And you say, well, you're, you're alive. God honored your prayer. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, no, he didn't. Not at all. I'm going to show you that right now. Look at John chapter 9, verse 31. God didn't hear my prayer at all. Didn't, didn't answer my prayer. <clears throat> John 9, 31. Now we know that God, what? Next two words. Heareth not what? That heareth not sinners who use him like Santa Claus. That's what, it, that's what it's implied there. He'll hear you if you cry unto him unto salvation. The Bible teaches us that. <clears throat> we have to take the Bible in context. But we know that God heareth not sinners. Not talking about people using him like I did. Like you did when you weren't saved. We just use him as a, as a uh, uh, what do you call that? A uh, uh, magic charm, you know, as a, a rabbit's foot, uh, you know, when we're in trouble. But God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, what does it say? Him, he what? Hear. God can hear my You say, well, Peter, you're alive. Yeah, you know why? See that little lady right there in the back row? The red sweater on? She can't hear me. She can't hear nothing anymore. She was praying. And she knew the Lord. She was connected to him. Old Mr. Shannon, he was praying. That's why I'm here. Ain't because of my prayer. God put this into me. It's because of Christian people who prayed and adhered to prayer and had a relationship with God who prayed for me. As I told you this morning, old Mr. Shannon said, Peter, do I remember you? I prayed for you last Wednesday night in prayer meeting. That was a good 10, maybe 12 years since I've been in Sunday school. <coughs> and he prayed. He said all those Wednesday night prayers, he'd be praying for me. And thought about me. That's amazing, folks. That's who he heard. You see, God heareth not sinners. He didn't hear people use them like Santa Claus, Fox Old Christianity. It says in Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face that he will not what? You know what it says? Isaiah 59, 2. Look at that verse, because unsaved people don't get their prayers answered. They don't, they, they, they can pray all they want. They can be superstitious. And the devil can answer prayers. He, he, he can fool people to, uh, to keep them in his clutches. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not what? Will not hear. And so he doesn't hear the prayers of unregenerate people that use him. He, he knows the heart, folks. He knows your heart. He knows if you've been born again, if you've truly trusted him or not. And so there's indeed power in prayers. My, my mother prayed and many others prayed for me. And some of you had people praying for you before you were saved. And God answered those prayers. Look at Acts 12, 5. We're talking about praying without ceasing, and it says in Acts 12, 5, we'll look at a couple more passages here along these lines. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but what was made for him? Prayer was made how? There you go. That's a Christian mark. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. It says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, please turn there and look. <clears throat> Romans 1 9. Easy to find right here quickly in the New Testament. Romans 1 9. For, my, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that, next two words, without ceasing. without ceasing, I make mention of you always, there's the word again, always, in my what? Prayers. Prayers. So Paul's praying without ceasing, unceasingly, and always, and so forth. 1 Thessalonians 2 13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. This is thanks to God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And then lastly, 2 Timothy 1.3 2 Timothy 1.3 2 Timothy 1.3 I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that how? Without ceasing. I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day. And so we have the examples of the Apostle Paul. The mark of a true believer is prayer and adherence to prayer. Men ought always to pray 
and not faint. We're always in an attitude of prayer. We're always in realization that God is with us. We can talk to him at any time. You can be walking through the Beaumont Mall and talk to the Lord. Amen. He's there. He hears you. And you believe that. Next, mark of a true believer. Assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation is a mark of a true believer. Galatians 4, 6. Look at Galatians 4, 6. I want to spend a little time on this and we'll give you the last one and we'll close. But <clears throat> assurance of salvation, Galatians 4, 6. And because you are what? Sons. Sons God hath set, set forth the spirit of the Son, where? Into your hearts, crying, Abba Father. That means Daddy. That's, that's a very precious word. Daddy. Almost childlike. Abba Father. Daddy. And if you come to know him, who's life eternal, and you've come to the Lord, you know he's your father. He's your daddy. He's taking care of you. And his spirit bears witness with yours. Romans 8, 16. Turn there. Romans 8, 16. <coughs> and we're talking about the assurance of salvation. How do you know? It says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we, next word, are, are what? Children. The children of God. There's a confirmation from the Spirit of God in your heart when you get saved. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, bears witness with your spirit and mine that we are the children of God. John 6, 37, important verses about the assurance, the mark of a true believer. Those who are saved know that they're saved because the Spirit bears witness in their heart. John 6, 37, all that the Father giveth me, Jesus said, next word, shall come to me, shall. All that the Father give to me are guaranteed going to come. They shall come, see? <clears throat> and him that cometh to me, I will in what? No wise. Now that's another archaic word, no wise. You know what that means? No way. That's what that means. Amen? Yeah. Him that cometh to me, I will in no way, no wise, and the, the word wise there is, is even more emphatic than our word way. It's, it's, it's got to do with a whole lot. There ain't no way <laughs> that he's going to cast you out. So <clears throat> you need to ask yourself, have I come to him? If you've come to him, that's because God said you shall. You will come to him. You would come to him. And when you did come to him, did he cast you out? No. If he did, he's a liar. And I say it reverently. He's not a liar. Amen. God is not a liar. You see, assurance of salvation is not based on our feelings. It is based on His promises. What He did in our hearts. You don't, I mean, we don't, you, sometimes you don't feel good, you don't always feel saved, do you? I mean, sometimes you feel rough, amen? And uh, it doesn't, it's not based on your feelings, how you feel today. The devil can play with your feelings. You might feel one way today, another way tomorrow. But, your salvation goes to the day when you trusted Christ, when your eyes were open to his truth, when you came to repent, you yielded, you waved the white flag. Remember that day? If you don't, then get to it. But if you remember that day, and you got the mark of repentance, God worked a lot of work on repentance in your heart, you realized you were wrong, he was right, 100%. You, you came to him and, and trusted him and yielded him, and uh, you got a new heart, you got new motives, new tastes, new standards. Things change in your life. Therefore, when man being Christ in the creature, old things pass away, all things come new. And, and you got a love for God's people. You started hanging out with God's people, loving the people, and growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and all those things. And, and, and God's spirit bore with us with your spirit. Then one day you come along, you don't feel too good. You ate too much garlic pizza before you went to bed. You wake up and say, man, I'm sorry. Now, what really happens is, what really happens to a Christian that begins to doubt for salvation, and it's, it's not always terrible or bad, but it usually means you're maybe tripping up. Maybe you're stumbling. It's possible we all do that. The Bible said if we confess our, God must assume we're going to have some. And so it's possible. And that's, what, that's when the devil creeps in and starts to make you try to doubt God. When you got all the rest. But it, it, you see, he said, I'll in no wise cast them out. John 10, 27, 29. Look at that passage real quick. John 27 through 29. I said John 10, 27. John 10. John 10, 25 through 29. Boy, I messed up. My notes ain't, I got to fix that. <laughs> John 10, 25 through 29. <clears throat> Let me just take a minute. 
forgive me, I'm going to fix it. John 10, what did I say? 25 through 29. I got a typo there. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name that bear witness of me. He's talking, he uh, says, but then the next verse, but you believe not because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Verse 27. And here's what I'm getting to. My sheep do what? Yeah. Hear my voice. And I know them, and they what? Okay, you need to ask yourself a question. Was there a time when you heard his voice? I don't mean an audible voice, but something tugged at your heart straight. <clears throat> you came to him and you began to follow him. And he said, when, when his sheep hear his voice, he knows them and they follow him. Verse 28, and I give unto them what? I give unto them eternal life. Now, you know what the word eternal means? Anybody got a good idea? I, I've talked this here before. Maybe, maybe you won't catch me. But you know what the word eternal means? You're, you're not going to dive in, huh? Everlasting. Everlasting. That's a good guess. Huh? All forever. Forever. Never ending. Okay, that's common. That's what people usually say. You see, the word eternal is unfathomable to us. There's only one being in the universe who has the attribute of eternality. Eternality is not just forever. It's not just forever and ever. Eternality means never having any beginning, nor having any end. And he said, when I got saved, he gave unto me and you who got saved eternal life. You know why? The very life of God. And dwelt you. The Holy Spirit of God came to live in you. And so, how in the world are you going to lose that? Ain't got a beginning, ain't got an end. Amen? You can't, these people teach you you lose your salvation. <clears throat> well, could you get unborn physically? Could you crawl back in your mother's womb and say, nah, I'm, I'm giving up on this. I don't, I don't want to stay here. No, nah, can't do that. Amen? You see, you're not in control of that. When you get born again, you get the birthmark of assurance of salvation. And he says, you'll come to him, you'll follow him, and he gives unto you and me eternal life. That will give us the goosebumps. And they shall, what? Verse 28. Never, never perish. Underline that word, never. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's, that's a good promise to hold on to. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. True believers have assurance of salvation. Now, true believers are many times plagued with doubt. That happens. I've talked to people many times that get these doubts. <coughs> and again, I'll say it's usually a result of some kind of a trip or a fall or something uh, we entered into something we know we shouldn't be doing. The devil wants to make a true Christian ineffective for God. That's his purpose. He wants to make you ineffective for the Lord, not be able to be used for the Lord. If he can trip you up and trouble you about your relationship to God and cause you to doubt God, you'll be distracted and you'll be set off course and you'll be ineffective for the Lord. You're not going to do anything for the Lord in that state, amen? And so real believers get filled with this doubt that the devil brings because he trips them up along the course of their life. And, and what we really need to do is figure out what sin has so easily beset us possibly is making us have these doubts that the devil probably tripped us up on, confess it to your heavenly Father, and then claim the promise that's found in the verse I quoted earlier on, uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. See, John, 1 John 1, 8. Look at 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Look there. And, and, and so you need to look at this. See, God already knows we got troubles because he says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say, so believe it, this, John's talking, the Apostle John. So if we, he, he's including himself, say that we have no sin, we do what? We deceive ourselves. We're sinners. We know that. And the truth is not in us. But if... We do what? Confess. Confess our sin. And the word again is homo again. Uh, means agree with God that what we did is erroneous, sinful, wrong against him. That he is faithful and just. Forgive us 
our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we do that. We do this, and then we carry on rejoicing in the Lord because of what He has promised to His undeserving children. It's amazing that we can come in confidence and boldness that He will forgive us of our sin. That's a, I mean, uh, we ought to all weep right now. That's amazing. It's just amazing because we're not worthy of that. But that's what He does. That's what He says. And so we need to hang on to that promise and don't let the devil uh, discourage us, make us ineffective for the Lord. You see, folks, I, I've often had people come and say, <clears throat> I'm having doubts and stuff, but I need to say to you, and I, I, don't, I don't want to make light of that, because you, you need to take spiritual inventory on your own life. I can't say abracadabra. I can't pronounce you say, but if you have all the other marks, and this is happening, and you're struggling, it could be that the devil is trying to trip you up. But let me tell you this. Unsaved people, people that don't have the marks, are not usually troubled or bothered at all about their quote-unquote salvation. They don't go around doubting something they don't have. Amen? And they really don't care. And so if there's any concern at all, that usually indicates to me that I'm talking to a believer who's gotten in trouble in some way, and the devil's trying to make them doubt God and doubt their wonderful salvation and the wonderful God that saved them. And so we do need to examine ourselves and make our calling election sure, as those verses we read in the beginning this morning said. We need to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, prove, test, discern our own selves. Know <coughs> that we're not, uh, uh, know ye not your own selves, how Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. We read that verse this morning. But look at this passage here. Look at 1 John 3, 18. And hang on to this, because the devil's good at uh, trying to make people neurotic. 1 John 3.18, down through 24. There's a wonderful passage here I want to point out to you. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And hereby we what? No. Know that we are of the truth. And shall, next word, assure our hearts before him. Talk about assurance of our salvation. And here it is, 1 John 3.20. For if our heart does what? And ain't that what happens? If our heart condemns us, here's a great problem. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. That's what happens. The devil gets you guilty and gets you condemned by your own heart. And he'll make you, he'll make, he'll mess you up. You, you'll be distracted. You won't be uh, effective for the Lord. So if our heart condemns us, we need to be confident. It's a problem. God's greater than our heart. I said, I said we're undeserving. <coughs> and uh, it's just wonderful. The God of this book, the God of this creation, the God, the only true and living God, He has paid it all in Jesus Christ, His Son. It's paid, it's finished, it's through. Now we're still going through the process, and we've got to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God's got things for us to learn. But if our heart's condemning us, God's greater than our heart. He knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. In other words, when we're not in that stew, we certainly do have confidence. Those of us who have the birthmarks have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. <clears throat> That's how we usually are seeking to live. And this is His commandment that we should do what? Believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what He said. And love one another as He gave us commandment. And He that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. And hereby we, what? Know that he abides in us, he stays in us, by the Spirit which he hath given us. And so God's Spirit will comfort you and uh, give you that assurance. i got one more passage I want to look at along these lines. Look at Isaiah 49, 16. 49, 16. Isaiah 49, 16. Just the first part of that verse. Behold, I have what? graven thee upon the palms of my hands. A great old Robert T. Kesson preached a great sermon on that text one time and talked about how that word graven means tattooed. We got a lot of tattooing going on today. And uh, for, for you, uh, he's, and God says he has graven us upon the palms of his hands. And, he, and the word is tattooed, which means if you've got to get rid of a tattoo, the only way you can really get rid of a tattoo is cut it out. You've got to cut a part of you out and 
and throw it away. I mean, it, 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 I know they got acid and salt and all kinds of things they're trying to do now, but it, it, it ain't going to do much good. You get that ink in you, it's pretty much done. But uh, God can't cut any of himself away. Amen? He wants to stay whole. And he said, Behold, I have braided thee as a blessing to me, because I heard the Lord keep catching and preach the message, but it's a wonderful passage, upon the palms of my hands. And that means real Christian people will keep on keeping on because God's got us in the palm of his hand. And that's a promise. Amen. Amen. That brings me to the last birthmark mark of a real, genuine believer. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You'll know what it is. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Turn there. Acts 1, verse 8. And ye shall be... Acts 1, 8. Should be... Joe must be able to quote that. No, am I right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And ye shall be... Witnesses. Amen. The last first mark of a true believer is a overwhelming burden for others that causes us to witness, to testify, as I exhorted you to, to this morning in Sunday school, and to share what God has done in our lives with others. It's not a burdensome thing or a task or a duty for People with the birthmarks of a true believer to tell others. That's something we have to do. Or it, we're something, it's something we're excited to do. We want to do. You, you want to share. If this is real to you and God did a work in your heart, you want to tell others. It's not just facts. It's a very real experience that we have with God <clears throat> with the result that we want the same thing for other people. Even our enemies. Even our, I don't, listen, honest. I, I mean, I got some enemies in this world, believe it or not. I don't want to see anybody, I'm sincere, I don't want to see anybody die and go to a devil's hell. I'm not, I'm, I'm really don't. I'm not that bitter. Uh -uh. I'd like to see him get saved, amen? Even our enemies, when you get saved, you want, you want to see people get saved. If they get saved, they probably wouldn't be your enemy anymore. But uh, we're going to have this because people don't get saved, they reject Christ. But <clears throat> a true believer has a burden for others. A genuine desire. Usually, the first we're concerned for is our own loved ones. I remember, I remember when I got saved. <coughs> I, I didn't, my wife just gave her testimony in uh, New York when Brother Bissell and Elaine and I went there. And I wanted to stand up and tell this part of it because she didn't get it in there real good. But uh, when I got saved, I had no idea. If she told me what I'm about to tell you, it went in here and out here. Because I'm in the band, I'm doing all these things. But... My wife went to Lutheran Church. And, uh, of course, when, when we first got married, we lived at my home, my mother and father's house for a little while there, and I was on the road, and my wife was here with my mother all day. And my mother didn't let anybody hang around the house too long until she started talking about Jesus. Amen. She'd always be witnessing. Yeah. She witnessed some of the... <laughs> I mean, she's a little kooky, but she, she witnessed some of the toughest, roughest-looking dudes that you ever seen in your life. Pagans, breed, musicians, weirdos, they come around, she'd tell about the Lord, she didn't care, it doesn't matter what they look like, it didn't matter her. And so my little girlfriend was nothing. And I'm on the road, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I guess my mother's telling <clears throat> my wife about being saved. My wife went to Lutheran church, and she never heard the word saved, ever. Now, I learned this later, I didn't notice what was going on. So my wife was going home, and she was getting her Lutheran Bible out and looking up the word S-A-V-E-D, and she was finding it. And she said, that word's in the Bible. She thought it was a Baptist word. That's what she thought it was something the Baptist people made up the word saved because she went to a Lutheran church. She never heard that word put just the way my mother was putting about you need to be saved. And so my, my wife read passages like Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, and she meditated on them, studied them. And uh, I believe it was that she, she trusted the Lord at, at her house, at, at her, in her bedroom. And she came back and told my mother. And somewhere along the course there of my career, they, my, that was an occasion. My mother wasn't going to church like she should have been at that time. All good Christians ought to be in church, but she wasn't pretending like she should have. Bad girl. But that was an occasion when my little girlfriend made a profession where they started going to church. Now, I, I never saw it happen. My wife tells me this happened, that they went for a while, and my wife was all excited. She got saved, and she, she, had, uh, she started to pray for a Christian marriage. I, I don't, I mean, whew, 
Uh, Brother Bristol can testify, we weren't even close to a Christian marriage. And my, my wife was praying in the middle of all. <laughs> he can go right back there. You can't. But, ooh, man, she's praying for a Christian marriage. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know any of that. So when I got saved, I thought she's lost. So I'm chasing her all around the house with the Bible. Dee, you got to read this. Dee, Dee. I, I, I'm pretty intense when I get intense, amen. I'm chasing her all around. They're, they're, you know, she go in the bathroom to get away from me. And we had this little dog that chewed the bottom of the bathroom door away until it was about that. I mean, it was, you know, it was all broken up about that. And I'd stick the Bible on the bedroom door and say, Dee, read that. Read that. I mean, that's true. And, and I was, she was reacting the wrong way. She wasn't telling me what happened, what I just told you. And I thought she was lost. And I thought, oh, man. She ain't got it, just like the band members. They rejected me, and my wife rejected me. And she, she, it, it was quite tense for a while. Because <laughs> I was intense, and she was getting full of pride, because I'm chasing her around now, telling her, and I was got living like I was living. Now I'm telling her about Jesus and being saved. And uh, I was only saved about three weeks. And Carl Shannos told me, to take my wife to some kind of seminar and some guys teaching Bible principles. I don't know who it was. I just knew Bible principles and broke down. I said, go. And so I told my wife, we're going to this thing. And she said, ah, I got to work. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I said, Gee. and she, she gave a little resistance, but praise the Lord, she went. And it was about two, three days into that seminar on the way home in the car one night in tears. She told me, well, I just told you that she had been saved with my mother, that she had trusted Christ, had a glorious transformation in her life, was praying for a Christian home, and now she said, I don't know what I'm trying to do, acting like I'm acting. And we rejoiced, amen. I don't, she, I remember that. She, she left all that good stuff out of that testimony back here in Seneca Falls. And that was a wonderful night when she told me how she had already trusted Christ, that my mother had led her to the Lord, and that she was saved and was praying for a Christian marriage. And I said, woo, hallelujah, amen. And that's the way it's been ever since. Never again was there any conflict like that. I mean, that was pretty tense. You, you can't probably believe that, but it was at that time. And so usually when you get saved, your first concern is your closest loved ones. Not necessarily your enemies, but even your enemies being included. You want to see people saved, amen. Even people you don't know. <coughs> you want to see people get saved. Now, Jeannie's stepdad, her real father died when she was 10 years old, and her stepfather didn't like me at all. Didn't like me at all. He was a Navy man, and uh, they called him OJ, Officer Joe. He's a career man in the Navy. And uh, he just did not, I, I don't want to get into all the details, you can figure it out. I mean, bless his heart, he had every right not to like me. Uh, I wasn't a very likable person in, in, in the frame of mind he was in as to where I was. Say. But uh, when I got saved, uh, even though he had been pretty rough with me and so forth, I, I just got a burden with him, sat down weeping with him a couple times, sharing the gospel with him. He, he was Roman Catholic, Irish, um, Joseph Hickey was his name. And uh, I uh, witnessed him and witnessed him. I, I guess I was only saved about a month uh, when he had a massive heart attack. I don't know how old he was, about 56, he was young. Had a massive heart attack and they put him in the hospital, he was going to die. And, I prayed. I, I was just new at all this stuff. I pleaded with God not to let him die. <clears throat> that that, that it, you, you God work in his heart. And they were going to give him up for death. And he, he lived. So that made me all the more intense. I hadn't been to Bible college yet. But when he lived, I said, Joe, I, God answered my prayers. You've got to listen to me. And I just put it to him, man. Best I could back in those days. And I witnessed to him. Though we didn't even talk to each other. I wouldn't even go in that house. For years as I was going with my wife. And, but see, that changed. When I got a new heart, when I got repentance, when I got the marks of a true believer, the guy that was once my enemy, I wanted him saved. And I witnessed him the best I could. And uh, he didn't live too much longer after that first shebang and had another massive heart attack and died. I never got the satisfaction to hear him say he got saved. But my mother-in-law, <coughs> Jean's mom, after he died, brought me his Bible. And she said, you know, when you used to talk to him, he used to go in and study and close the door. And I didn't know what he was doing. But she said, I was looking at that Bible. He got it all marked up on them verses where you were telling him. And we looked in there, and he had John chapter 3, 
just saturated with marks about Nicodemus and being born again. That's the one text I know. Now, I don't know. I can't give you any hope. I, can't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. What, what was the outcome of that? <laughs> I never got the satisfaction to hear him say, oh, I got saved. He, he died. But wouldn't it be something if one day when I get to heaven, he's there? But that's up to the Lord anyway. But the thing is, my point is in saying this is you get, you get a desire for your loved ones, my wife, but even people who necessarily weren't your loved ones. You get, a, you get this strange desire. You want to see people saved. Amen? If you got it, you know what I'm talking about. You look at people you don't even know walking around the malls and shopping centers and your heart goes out. That's a mark that you're a real Christian because you know this stuff is true. And you look at what's going on. You say these people are hustling and bustling. And where are they going to? There's a story called about Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday used to <coughs> perform a lot of crazy antics. He was a baseball player years ago. They got gloriously saved. I think he was in the early 1900s. He preached in Scranton and closed the bar rooms down. You can go find newspapers down there in the library about when Billy Sunday was here. had his revivals. He put these tabernacles up in these buildings. And uh, uh, he had one here in, in Scranton somewhere. And... and uh, People come from everywhere, and he, he, would, uh, he was quite a preacher, I guess. He did all kinds of things. He, he'd preach a message on uh, uh, running home or something, run around the bases, running right around the room, and slide into home base and, and the pulpit. He'd jump up on top of the pulpit. He, he was kind of an animated kind of guy, I guess. A man of my own heart. But uh, anyway, he was in a motel one time, and some of the ministerium came to him, and they questioned him and, uh, about his annex, why he preached. The way he did, why he acted the way he did in the pulpit. <clears throat> they were in this motel room and they came, uh, some of the people on the council for the revival meeting or wherever it was, uh, talking to him, <clears throat> questioning him on the way he preached. He called over to the window of the motel room in the city and he had to look out and describe what they saw. He said, fellas, just one by one, describe what you see down there. Well, one guy sees the busy streets and the stores, he's talking about that. Another guy sees the cars running to and fro. One guy sees the people running everywhere, shopping frantically. One guy comments on the architecture and the many buildings in the vast city. So then pretty soon they said, well, Billy, uh, what do you see? Billy said, I see that multitude of lost, condemned souls. All those people down there dying without Christ. They're lost. Lost without hope, without Christ, on their way to a real hell. For all eternity, yes, men, I see them engulfed in the flames of hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's why I preach the way I do. Because I believe the Bible. Don't you? And I close with that. If you have the marks of a true believer, you have a burden for souls. And you believe the Bible, don't you? Hell is very real. Your loved ones were not saved. They're going to die in the little devil's hell. You can't save them. But you need to tell them best you can. As God gives you opportunity, share with them. This is a good time. Christmas. Send them a card. Send them a CD. Send them something. <clears throat> send them a book. Something to read. Uh, send them your own heart in a letter. And witness to them. Share with them. Don't be snotty and nasty to them. Tell them you love them. You get to see them. Shed some tears with them. That's all right. Don't be embarrassed. Be all right. But if you're saved and born again, you have the mark of repentance. You have a new heart, new motives, new tastes, new ideals. You have a love for the brethren. You have an understanding and a sensible desire for the word of God. You have prayer with God and adherence to prayer. You have assurance of your salvation. God's spirit bears witness with your spirit. You are his child. And you have a burden for others that they might come to the same knowledge that God has brought you to. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. For these marks that you instill into our lives that were not natural but supernatural. That you've given to so many in this room tonight. Thank you for them, Lord, here tonight who are genuinely born again. But the beginning in our midst who've never trusted Christ, never been born again. I pray that your spirit would crush them even tonight. Deal with their heart. Enable them to see their desperate need. <clears throat> that they might realize that they're lost and without hope and will die. And go to a devil's hell, a very real place called hell. That you prepare not primarily for them, but for the devil and his angels. But your word says that those that reject you <coughs> will be cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts tonight mightily as only you can. I pray that you'd work in our hearts as believers. Help us to be able to say with Paul, as we began this message, Brethren, be followers together with me and mark them which walk so that you have us 
as an example or an example, as Paul said. Help us to be the examples we need to be, Lord. We need you to work in us to win us to do of your good pleasure. We desperately need your help. We're sinners saved by your grace. We're thankful that we can know you and know your word and know the things that we've been able to share tonight. I just pray that you meet with us tonight in a special way and that decisions will be made for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking. As I said in the beginning, it's a simple message. Very simple. You either have these things or you don't have them. I'm not trying to get you to conjure them up and work them up in yourself. You can't do that. You gotta, if you don't have them, you gotta put the brakes on and come to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I'm running away. I need to come home. I need to trust you. I need to believe on you. If God is showing you tonight that you lack these marks and you need them, you need to bow your head before him and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I'm gonna receive Christ as my savior like Paul did. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and he's alive tonight. If he's dealing with your heart, you know that he's alive. He'll bring you under great conviction and realization that this message is true. I can't do that. He can. And he does that, I'm sure. So that's happening to you tonight. I would just ask you to bow your head before him and tell him <coughs> that you're ready to trust him as your Savior. This is the night for you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. And if you're coming to that place, we would like to rejoice with you and pray for you. I'm not going to come get you. I'm not going to point you out. Nobody's looking. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. But if there's someone here not sure you're saved, but you'd like to get sure and you want to square away with the Lord tonight and God's dealing with you, if you'll just slip your hand up, we'll rejoice with you. I'll just tell you to put it back down and we'll be happy and rejoice and we'll pray for you in the close of the service. Anybody here not sure you have these marks, but you'd like to make sure. Now don't be ashamed. If it, don't, don't feel funny. It ain't nothing to feel funny about. If you're not sure, but you'd like to be sure, just slip your hand up. And we'll pray for you. Now I know most of you, I know many of you, and I know many of you are saved here tonight. And I thank God for that. But pray that if there are any in our midst not saved, they might come to a saving knowledge of Christ quickly. <clears throat> and then, I'm not going to ask you Christians to raise your hands, but raise your hearts. And say, Lord, these marks, am I showing forth these marks? Do people see that I've come to build repentance? They see that difference. That I made a 180 degree change, turn around in my life, uh, along the course of my life. And that I have a <clears throat> new heart, new motives, new tastes, new standards that I live by. <clears throat> Do you read your Bible? Maybe you haven't been like you should. But if, if you're saved, you, if you're not reading your Bible, there's something wrong. Because when you're born again, you made alive, you. you can't live without God's food. Not only do you love the word, you love the fellowship of the saints, and you love to be in church where the word's preached. It's not just a duty to be here. It's not just a task, something you've got to do. You want to be here. I want to be here. Not because somebody told me I'm supposed to be. I just desire to be here. <laughs> I'm not everything I should be, but I sure do love to be with the Lord's people and his word and love to be in his church, learning of him. So if you've been lacking some of those areas, just talk to the Lord about it and we'll get square away you and the Lord. Father, thank you for this church, for what it stands for. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, help us that these marks would be strengthened in our lives so that people would see the difference and know that we're a different and peculiar people that you indeed have <coughs> brought from darkness into your marvelous light. We ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Pastor Bissett. Remember? Chapter 57. Chapter 57. Let's all stand and close it.
manifest these works or these uh, fruits. And from, if there's some here not saved, then uh, they ought to search their hearts, they ought to examine themselves. Yes. And uh, so two applications to the message tonight, just apply it to our hearts as only you can. We thank you for this and praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you.